The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> you think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? <laughs> well, I must have not been paying attention when you were just talking to me. Do you think that you could repeat the question? We're up and running. Hey, sure. I try so hard not to be an asshole, but then there are times when you have no choice. So and it's you, not directed and, at me, huh? And you, no, 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 no. I'm like, are we leading into something No, here? no, no, <laughs> my dear. I thought it was going to be, I try really hard not to be an asshole, but, and then I thought you were going to like hit me with something. No, no. I'm ready, I think. No. Really. Talking about my, my Facebook post oh. from, this, from yeah. about 20 minutes ago. I'm sure you have a ton of supporters. I try, I try so hard. And I try because I know that it's easy for me to be an asshole. So I try really hard not to be. Right. It's a lot harder work for you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> People do. have no idea how hard <laughs> that is. And then sometimes I just go, you know what? I don't know why I'm holding back. I'm better now, I think. All right. Shouldn't have to fight people to do something good. No. We won't talk about it because I think it's been resolved, but... Right. Let's leave it for now. Stop on you Oh, here it comes. <clears throat> ba, 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 ba. Oh, my. Wow. Oh, I'm pretty sure you're going backwards. I think point. I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Tom. Oh, boy. If I didn't have a guest oh, today, I would have just uh, stayed in bed. All right. Murphy Stern over there. Are you ready? we got to get him on the show someday. That'd be a thrilling show. All right. <laughs> you want to do the sponsors today? Yeah, sure. All right, cool. <clears throat> ba, 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 ba. Hey, I hit all three Ooh, on that one. you wow. did. Wow, see that? It wasn't strong, but you no. fully completed My all three. My voice is going to come back. It's going to stop yelling at people. Yeah. As soon as it starts getting better, I gotta yell at somebody, and then as I walk away, I go, "Shit, why did I do that?" <laughs> Shouldn't have to yell at people, but boy, people suck, man. They don't make it easy. All right, let's get this show on the road, shall we? Hi, how you guys doing? My name's Tom Duggan with the Paying Attention Podcast. Hi, atop two guys smoke shop at the Studio Twenty One Podcast Cafe. We are a forty. Four days until our until our annual Valley Patriot Charity Bash scholarship and award night that we do every year, and I've got to tell you, it's 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 a lot of work, and I'm and I'm not like patting myself on the back or looking for sympathy, but boy, when you've got to fight people to do something good, it's it's so frustrating. Um, but I think we've got we, I think we've got everything resolved. We should have every kid's name, photo, and bio by today. We're still waiting on two, so actually, I think we're still waiting on. One and uh, and so hopefully next week I'll be able to come in. We'll go through all the kids. We'll we'll put their pictures up with their bios, uh, how much money they're they're uh, they're getting so far. Uh, but we do have a tote board, and I can't. Yeah. Let me see if I can pull mine up so I don't have to squint okay. at the. Uh, I can always do it. I got at it. The, uh, crap! You got it? Yeah, I got it. You want me to read it out for you? Yeah, why don't you do it? Since All I can't right. See it. So, as of, I'm assuming this is as of today. This is as of uh, actually last night. Oh, I have, okay. I picked up some checks here, but I haven't logged them yet. All right. So. so, as of last night, we are standing at for the Dan Cody Memorial Scholarship. $2,185. We have the Lawrence High Junior ROTC Scholarship. That is at, wow, a $4,910. And that scholarship, our, in all these scholarships, our goal was 5000 But because the ROTC is getting so high, that we may, we may bump our goal up to 7000 on wow. that one. Yeah, why maybe, not? Right? All right. Uh, Haverhill, uh, Haverhill High, the Benedetti, is at $1,400. 
We have the Greater Lawrence Tech is at $1,720. Whittier is at $1,475. The Methuen High Studio 21 scholarship is still standing at $2,100. And the Special Needs Scholarship is currently standing at $1,230. That gives us a grand total at the moment of $15,020. In three weeks. In three weeks. If you would like to contribute to any of our scholarships, scrolling through the bottom of the screen uh, for the entire show today and probably for most of the shows up until the bash, really, until mm -hmm. we close... I uh, close it, is all the information. There's, uh, what have we got there? We've got PayPal, you've got Cash App, we have a, the address if you want to send a check. So there's many ways to donate. It is for a great cause. Uh, I'm sure the kids will highly appreciate it. Yeah, and please don't make me chase you to get kids' names. That's all I ask. Um, so, and we've also picked all of our award winners except for one. So uh, I want to thank uh, Randy and Jason at Clear Path for Veterans New England for picking our veteran hero veteran winner. I want to thank Methuen Police Chief Scott McNamara for picking two Methuen Police Officers for our Officer Tom Duggan Hero Police Officer Award. I want to thank, uh, well, I can't thank him publicly, but I want to thank uh, our contact at the Lawrence Fire Department. That's going to be a surprise. Um, so he doesn't know he's getting it, but he's somebody who's very popular. And I'm, oh. I, I was going to announce it because if I announce it, we'll, we'd sell 10 tables like the minute I announce it. Right. Because everybody loves this guy. Um, but he, he doesn't know he's getting it. So we're going to have to find another way to do that. And then we're going to do a uh, – so we do police fire. We have an annual Scott Clegg public, uh, public Service Award. We uh, want to thank uh, – who, got, who got us those? Oh, I actually, I think I picked those too. Um, we have two that we're going to give out to people in the community who help, who help the community, people who are underappreciated, people who help the homeless, people who help veterans, people who are out doing stuff. And never take pictures like on Facebook of them handing a homeless person a sandwich going, look at me, like some people, right? Mm -hmm. They're people that go out there, they do it quietly, they don't want to be thanked, and they don't get thanked, and that's one of the reasons why we picked them. And then we've got, um, so we have two awards that we don't give every year. We only give them when somebody nominates. We have a First Amendment award which we haven't given out in about five years. And we got zero nominations for that this year, and that's okay, because that just shortens the program for us, and that will, that will make Jana, uh, Jana uh, Zanny Pesci less mad at me. She's trying to shorten the program. But we also have uh, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award that we also don't give every year. Now, only two people have received this award over the last uh, 18 years. Uh, we gave one to uh, former Lawrence City Councilor Mike Sweeney, who is now the director, believe it or not, of the Mass State Lottery. He's really oh. kind of moved, moved himself up since he left Lawrence, which is pretty good. Um, and the other one was former Lawrence, former Methuen Mayor Steve Zani, um, for all the work that he did as a school committee member, as a city councilor, as a mayor, as uh, he's been involved in like exchange clubs and a whole bunch of other stuff. He got that one like, I don't know, six years ago or so. This year we're going to give two. And they don't know it yet. And since neither one of them watched my program, I know I, I have no problem. I have no problem telling you guys who it's going to be because it's going to be a surprise. So, if, so after I tell you, please just don't tell them. So it's a don't ruin don't ruin it for them. You're not hurting me if you tell them. You're ruining it for them. So if we can get Linda Campbell in the room, we're going to give her a lifetime achievement award. She was on the Methuen School Committee on the City Council. She was a state rep for at least ten to fifteen years. And she's the one that's, that, that helped exonerate Francisco Urena when he was wrongfully blamed for the deaths at the old soldier's home during COVID. She, she went above and beyond to exonerate him. And she was so disgusted by the way Francisco Urena, a hero Marine Purple Hot winner, she was so disgusted she chose not to run for re-election at the end of wow. all of that because that's how disgusted she was and she deserves an award for that. And also we're going to give one to Marcos Devers. First Dominican mayor in the country, first Dominican mayor of the city of Lawrence, first Dominican city councilor in the country, first Dominican state rep in the country. And most people don't know that. Most people have no clue um, the barriers that Marcos Devers has broken and so... We're going to give him an award, and I'm, going to, and I'm trying to get the mayor to come up and present it, because they, they don't really get along all that well. But because the bash, and I say this every year, is a night of amnesty, the minute you walk in the room, you've got to put aside whatever your feelings are for anybody else and go along with the program and help us to honor people, whether you like them or you don't. We, we're honoring their accomplishments, not whether we like them or not. So I think the mayor is a grown-up. He's, he's no Mayor Perry. He's, he's, he'll, he'll be in the room whether he likes Marcos or not, and I'm sure when I ask him, he's going to say yes, because that's the kind of person he is. Um, 
I also uh, want to send our condolences to uh, Nilka Alvarez, former city councilor, passed away yesterday, uh, to her family, uh, Richard Rodriguez, and his, I know she's got at least two, I think maybe three kids. Um, I haven't seen Nilka in probably about five or ten years, maybe, well, probably about five years I've seen, I haven't seen Nilka. Um, she never really got the credit that she deserved for a lot of the hard work that she did in the community. We may do something at the Bash for her. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. We, we, we just have to find a way to squeeze it into the program. And also, we lo- I lost a very good friend yesterday, uh, Jim Wagner, who was the president of the Lawrence Lions Club forever. And he's the guy that got me involved in the Lawrence Lions Club. And he's the guy that coerced me into becoming the president of the Lawrence Lions Club. And I was so mad at him for that, but not in a bad way. I was just like, come on, what are you doing? Um, And Jim Wagner passed away. And he was such a great guy. This is a guy that um, spent almost his entire life trying to help other people. And volunteering his time and not getting paid for it and not getting thanked. And, uh, And so our condolences to Marie and everybody in his family. Uh, for that. Um, I also, uh, I was going to talk about Steve Sable. We're going to do that next week because he really just doesn't even deserve the publicity, quite frankly. In the studio with me today, I've got a guy who wrote a book. And um, for those of you who like to read, even for those of you who don't really like to read all that much, it's a very easy read. He wrote a book, and I generally don't have authors on the show because most authors... They, 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 they're kind of dry, you know what I mean? They don't have the bombastic kind of personality as writers like I do. Uh, but I knew Charlie's dad. Uh, Charlie Eat is with us today. He wrote this book called Snap Diagnosis. Um, and I knew his dad. They also, I think, did you also have a brother that worked at Bishops? I worked at Bishops. Oh, you worked and, at Bishops. And my brother George worked George, at Bishops. George, right. So we worked together at Bishops back in like... I think you were a little behind me. 80, I worked there 83, 84, 85? I was there from 70 to 80. Okay, all right. So we, we crossed. Uh, we, did, we didn't know each other, but we both worked at Bishops. And we kind of missed Bishops, too. That was What a great restaurant it great was. Place, huh? Great place, great place. And Abe Bashara, what, what, a, what a great guy. A lot of good memories. <laughs> Uh, Charlie wrote this book, and he called me. He sent me the. It was nice enough to send me a copy of the book. I have to have you sign it before we leave, though. You didn't sign it for me. <laughs> um, and it, and it's it's something that I hear about a lot uh, because I'm a newspaper. We're a newspaper. People call us with their nightmare stories all the time, thinking it would make great news. Um, and a lot of times, I listen to their stories about similar issues that Charlie's going to talk about today. And I think, wow, it's, it's such a long story. I don't know how we get like a short news story out of that. That kind of seems more like a book, and I always tell people when they call me about this kind of stuff, you should probably write a book, because I don't know that we could do it justice in a, in a small news article. Um, Charlie did that. He went out and he wrote a book about his experience, and it centers around the field of psychology and how psychologists can take away your rights. Psychiatrists. I'm sorry, psychiatrists? Do I say psychology? You said psychology. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, I'm my, sorry, my no. mouth is ahead of my brain. No, correct me when I'm wrong. Please do. Um, so it's around the field of psychiatry and how psychiatrists can take away your rights. With, with, with You get no appeal. You get no advocate. You don't get a lawyer. You don't get a phone call. They can just kind of like come into They can determine on their own, having never even seen you, having never even evaluated you. They can, on an anonymous complaint, have the cops come to your house and take you and, and commit you against your will. And, and by the way, seize your assets, too. That's the part where I'm at right now, where they're seizing your assets. Um, what made, what made you, I mean, you went through an, an awful lot. What made you want to write the book? Well, two reasons why I wanted to write the book. Number one, I wanted to clear my reputation uh, because I feel that before this ordeal began, Tom, I had built up a very good reputation. I worked my way through school at Bishop's, uh, all the way to graduate school, paid all my tuitions. I was an athlete growing up. I ran the marathon, played sports all through high school and college. Um, I feel I was a somebody, an achiever, and I don't feel like this behavior that was rendered to me by these psychiatrists was befitting of my background. And I wanted to clear the air. A lot of people lost a lot of respect for me. I was stigmatized after this ordeal in the community. I lost a lot of friends, a lot of family members kind of shunned me, uh, looked down upon me, and that hurt me tremendously. It, It still hurts me when it happens. I wanted to set the record straight and say, no, I'm not mentally ill. You got it wrong. Stop judging a book by its cover. Secondly, I wanted to expose the system, which is currently still abusing systemically patients in psychiatric hospitals. Psychiatry might claim that that's a thing of the past, that once they open the psychiatric hospitals and let people out in the 80s and 90s under Reagan and uh, whatever, that that ended. 
The truth is, my research indicates, Tom, that the systemic problem is even worse than it was before. Wow. Typical example, in psychiatric hospitals, people have been known to apply for jobs there as orderlies and staff members solely for the only reason of being able to go into the wards uncontested and beat the living shit out of patients and not get caught. And uh, they call this a takedown, and they claim that they get an endorphin high out of it, similar to a runner's high. This is appalling to anyone of good conscience. It shouldn't happen in 21st century America. This is something out of the Middle Ages. And I, for those two reasons, Tom, I wrote the book. So I have friends with state senators, state representatives, people who are in government who can probably do something about this. Is, the, is there no law that says, I mean, is, is there nothing on the books that says if a psychiatrist deems that you're dangerous or that, you're psycho- that you need to be committed and tries to involuntary commit, is, is there any kind of law that, that, that protects your rights? No, psychiatrists have total authority to commit any individual. You could be sitting in your home watching a sport, uh, the Patriots game, and the police could come to your door, come with us. What do you mean? What's this all about? Please explain. Come with us. Don't give us a hard time. They'll throw you into their cruiser and drag you to a high psych hospital. You'll be admitted for a 10 or 12 day stay. There's absolutely nothing you can do to fight it. By the time you get an attorney to get you out, 12 days have passed. False medical records have been written about you. You're now deemed mentally ill and you're stigmatized for the rest of your life as a result of some psychiatrist having having a, 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 a bad feeling about you and wanting to get back at you. This happened to me. I told the psychiatrist to get lost when he told me I had a psychiatric problem. I didn't even know I was going to see a psychiatrist. In in punishment, in retribution, he forcefully hospitalized me, had the police come to my house. That's Dr. George DiNapoli of Andover. I didn't change the names of people in the book. You can read it. Good for you. Uh, George DiNapoli of Andover. This guy had the audacity to recently write a book about psychiatry, claiming that he was an authority. And he hospitalized me for totally punitive reasons because I told him I didn't want his services and to get lost. And I believe this happens so many times. These people have egos. They feel they're above the law, and it's got to be stopped, Tom. And this is, this is my crusade right now. I have other goals for the future, social goals. I like to get involved in politics. But right now, my main focus is exposing the abuses of present-day psychiatry. And, I, and, and you might not... You might not Go along with me, Tom, but I believe psychiatry is an industry, not a profession. No, I, I totally agree with that. I, it's I, become an industry where making money and treating people for money for, for selfish, greedy reasons, which this guy wanted to do with me, and which came later in my treatment program with other psychiatrists. They saw, they saw dollar signs in me. Um, this is appalling. This is totally appalling. The public knows very little about psychiatry. We all know about nuclear war. We all know about climate change. We're plugged into these issues. But I ask the public to take a quick look at the abuses of psychiatry. Read my book if you'd like. I explain it all plainly of how the system works, how the game is played. And by the way, it's very, as a writer, I told you this off the air, I'm going to say it on the As a writer, I was very impressed by how well you write. Now, because I'm a writer, right? When I read the newspaper, I'm not just reading it for content. Because I'm a writer, I'm also evaluating how the writer put, the, put it together. This is extremely well written. It's a very easy read. Very easy. You, you deserve a lot of credit for that. I tried to write from the heart, Tom. Yeah. And I spoke the truth even when it, I, it cast me in a negative light of some incidents that happened in my life which were embarrassing. I felt it was important to include the whole truth of, in my memoir. So, and I did so at, at sometimes at my own detriment. But I wanted to speak the truth. I wanted people to believe that this is the truth that I spoke. There was no lies in the book. I didn't fabricate anything or exaggerate anything. What you read is exactly what happened the way it happened. Are you worried that this Dr. DiNapoli or anybody else that you named in the book is going to sue you? Uh, I don't care if they sue me. I'm, uh, I'll that's, see. that's the right answer, by the way. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, I speak the truth. I walk with God. I, God will protect me in court. He's protected me all along. I'm a very religious man, Tom. I've become more religious going through this experience. God never let me down a minute. He was with me every step of the way. Miracles happened where I was prevented from receiving shock treatment, where I was, I received places to stay when I was hospitalized. One miracle after another that showed me that the guy upstairs likes me and that he was on my side. And that, that is a force that you can't compensate with. 
You, there's no substitute for that. When you believe you're in the right, that God's behind you, you can accomplish anything in this world. And that's, that's the force that's driving me right now. I don't believe I could be stopped. So if I were to write a bill, because like I said, I, we, we have a lot of friends at the Valley Patriots who are sen state senators, state representatives. If I were to write a bill to try and put a stop to this so that we would have a state law that said uh, that you had to have, say, if a psychiatrist deemed you, um, what's the word? Uh, mentally ill. Mentally ill, that you could that you should have an advocate who's independent of that person who could come in and mentally evaluate you and decide. Somebody totally independent. An ombudsman. An ombudsman. Like, right, like an ombudsman. If I could write a law like that, and I have, I know, of, I can, off the top of my head, I can think of at least two state representatives right now that I know would file it if we wrote it. Um, would that be something that you would do? Would you go and testify before, I would, the, I before would, the House? I, I make myself available to anybody who wants to talk to me or email me or contact me or any legal process, I would welcome something like that because I think it's long overdue. This has been dragging on for years. Psychiatry's had been running roughshod over people for, for decades, and nothing's done. And, and the way our political climate is today, they don't, these politicians don't seem to want to get anything done no, of constructive don't. value. So no. I think you're up against that, but I would welcome it, Tom. I would welcome something like that, and I'm going to help you in any way I can. So tell me what it is. If I was to write a bill to help, because I'm not done the book yet, and right? I'm sure that there's way more, way, way, way more worse things than what I know. Um, if I, was, if, if I was to sit down and write a bill, and I'd obviously enlist your help, what, what, what protection should someone have when something like this happens to them? Like, give us, a, give us like a bullet point on what you would like to see a change in the law. First of all, besides the armor. First of all, I would like to see the laws of Section 12 and forced hospitalization changed. The police are not mental health workers. They're unqualified <laughs> to be dragging people away to psych hospitals. They're third party people, they act like they know what they're doing. They de In New York right now, the mayor of New York, uh, the new mayor, the black mayor, and I'm not prejudiced, I'm not saying that because I'm prejudiced, but the black mayor, he used to be the police chief, is now ordering police to walk around the streets of New York and grab and drag away anybody who looks mentally ill to psych hospitals in New York City. They keep them there for a month, they throw them back out, and they're in the same situation they were in before, only now they're stigmatized. This is an abhorrent act of our, our political process to be dragging people who you don't know anything about just because they might look mentally ill or they might look disheveled or they might look like they're hurting. To drag them away to mental hospitals? Is this what America has come to, the land of the brave and the free? I don't think so. This isn't the America that I grew up in. Certainly Something not. is amiss. And you know, what's funny is that when I had the police chiefs on, and we're going to have them back, we usually have them in December, but we have two police chiefs <laughs> that, are, that are having some problems right now, so we haven't done it. But usually we have the police in here. Every time the cops come in and we talk about the homeless and addiction issue in the Merrimack Valley, and I ask them, is there anything that the legislature can do to try and fix that problem. You know what they tell me, Charlie? They say, if they could go back to doing involuntary commitments when you Narcan someone who's died from heroin overdose, that would be really helpful because otherwise they can just sign themselves out the next day. And now I'm thinking, well, if we, keep, if we can't do that for the homeless addicts who are dying of fentanyl out there and involuntary committing them just to get them clean, how is it that we can take someone who's not an addict, have a psychiatrist sign off on it, and, and, and involuntary commit them? Tom, uh, let, me, let me put, let me tell you, you know what my feeling is on that. I believe that we need places to send people to protect them from themselves when they're suicidal. Suicide is running rampant in America now. Right. So many people are suicidal because of the economic crisis, because people feel hopeless. Um, and suicide is a big problem. We need to get people off the streets and in a safe place where we can watch them until they overcome their crisis and can get back out into free society. I have no problems with that. But why do we need locked wards? Right. Why do these psychiatric hospitals need to be locked and nobody can go in and no cameras can come in? Right. Why do we need to lock people up like, like prisoners if they have a mental illness? Right. Is that right? Is that therapeutic no. and to beat them up while they're in there beat the shit out of them and with impunity is that therapeutic is there any recourse can you sue the state can I you tried, sue the I hospitals tried to, I tried many years ago to get a lawsuit going unfortunately I was told by a lot of lawyers a lot of local lawyers and some big time Boston lawyers that psychiatric uh, uh, malpractice is hard to 
proven court because there's so many. You can go to five different psychiatrists and get five different diagnoses. These people cover up for themselves. I was seen by multiple psychiatrists who rubber stamped the diagnosis of this original monkey. And uh, I, uh, I was told that I, I couldn't pursue the case. Finally, I got somebody to pursue the case, a Boston attorney, a well-respected firm. They butchered the case. They blew it. And they dropped my case uh, in the middle of proceedings because they said I was complaining too much on how the case was being run. So it was a, it was a difficult thing to go to the courtroom and get justice. I, I believe my book is a better way to expose the system than just a lawsuit. So a couple of lawyers told me a lawsuit is only about money. You're not going to get any exposure. So I feel I'm in a better place now. Chrissy, is that countdown, is that countdown or count up? Oh, it's counting up. So to what number? 40. Okay. I mean, just, just check it because usually it's a countdown. Um, as I'm reading this book, I can tell you that one of the things that kind of thrilled me was your descriptions of the people and the places in Lawrence. Um, there's a, a thing in there about Judge Paraki, who I knew really well as a kid. Most people who are our age probably remember him. Um, I'm sure and, he was a nice man, but I, my meeting with him was not fruitful. Right. It resulted, Tom, from an incident, a domestic incident with my dad that I, I still feel badly about today, where my mother got involved and... Uh, it was a family dispute, and I was dragged into court and humiliated publicly. I suffered greatly for it. The judge wanted to send me to jail. Uh, my dad said, no, I'm not sending my son to jail, and it was dropped. But uh, that's the story with Judge Brock. Right, right. And yeah, I was 19 years old at the time. I was a kid. I, I didn't have the, the, the frame of mind that I would have now to, to be more diplomatic. I, I was a little impulsive with my dad. Punches were thrown. Uh, it was a nightmare. It, it was the worst it was the worst thing in my life, and I've worked hard to put it behind me, but people in the community still uh, don't understand it. They look at me as a pariah. That's not the case. I'm not a bad guy. It just happened, and it, it was, as my father said in court, an aberration. Yeah. And, and some of the, even some of the descriptions, when I, was, when I said you were a good writer, the way you, the way you described the, the Lawrence Jail on Hampshire Street... As a, as, a, as a dungeon, and, and I'm thinking about, like, I remember the jail, and, and it was a dungeon. I remember going in there, and that's exactly what it was. But I never would have probably described it that way if I was writing a book. It was really well written. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in this book that are still alive, yes. that we still all know, and it must have been fun to write, because, you know, I've, I've, I've published three books, but I haven't written, like, a biography yet of myself, because... I, I think I, we'd like to see that, Tom, someday. Yeah, I, I, and I would love to... Starting with your father when he was... Yeah. I think yeah. that's a starting point for Right. You. Well, you know, I tried to write a book about my dad, just about my dad, um, and, and for the last 20 years, I've started it and then, then put it away and then started it again and put it away because it was too emotional for me. I'd like to read it. It, it, was, it was tough, but, but I am going to do it. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm Committed to doing it, it's just a matter of having the time. I got doing, five doing something minutes. like this is very cathartic. Is it? Yeah. It brings up, wells up a lot of negative emotion, but in the end, you're better off getting it off your off your chest. Yeah. I felt so much better after writing this book. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't get it out. I was frustrated. The lawsuit didn't go well. How am I gonna How am I gonna let other people know what happened? And just writing the book and getting it published. It was like being freed of a million problems. I felt so relaxed, and now I feel so good about myself. I, I, I walk with my head up high because I know that I'm right. And my grandfather told me when I was a kid, when you know you're in the right, don't take a backward step for anybody. And that's kind of driven me all my life. How do people get the book? Uh, it's on Amazon. Oh, it is on Amazon. Yeah, Great. I made its way on Amazon. All right, on I'll, I'll post that, that link. I believe it's on uh, Barnes & Noble uh, website. Okay. Uh, and um, I do have a publisher, um, and I believe the book sells for twenty dollars, Tom. Okay. All right. Anyone wanting a direct link can go to our show description today. I've oh, you got it already? In. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Oh, I, I was going to look it up. That's what I do. I was going to look it. Was there when you were writing this book, and when I started when I started writing my book, and then didn't finish it? Um, when you, when when you started writing this book, were there were there thi were there things that You'd forgotten all about, and then as you're writing it, you go, oh, my God, I forgot all about that, and you start. <laughs> it's kind of amazing because my nephew read the book, and he says, you've got to turn this memory, Uncle. A lot of these things, I don't know where it came from, but once I started writing, the information just started to flow out of me like water. 
I mean, one thing after another, the next instant, the next instant, everything fell into place. A lot of these things I had forgotten about, but when I started writing, miraculously, I started to remember right. details, specifics. And uh, it was very uh, unusual, but uh, uh, that's what happened to him. Just starting the writing process is, is a good thing. Yeah, writing is very cathartic, and even if I'm writing about something else, like a news story, I always feel better after I'm writing. I yeah. always feel like I got something off my chest, even though I'm writing about someone else and it's not my own thoughts. A lot of people get that same feeling writing poetry. I'm not, right, I don't right. write poetry, but a lot of my friends do, right. and they say it's very cathartic. Yeah, very good. Have you had any support uh, for your book? Are there people that kind of looked at you funny before and then, have, and then read your book and came to you and said, get, you know what, you're not a bad guy and I'm sorry? I, I have uh, had like about 20 people read the book so far, friends, uh, relatives, and all of them said, Chuck, I'm, I'm sorry what happened to you. Uh, one friend who was in, in, in uh, Guatemala fighting the uh, narco people said to me, I wasn't around, Chuck, to stop this. I, I feel so guilty that I let you down. And um, other people have read it and they say, wow, this is... I'm sorry that this happened. So everything I've given it to people to read, attorney Anthony DeFruce is reading it right now. Um, I have another attorney in Andover that's helping me with this, uh, Mr. Caruso, Peter Caruso. He's my attorney. Yeah, he's encouraging Well, he's me. the guy that told you to, to reach to me, right? He told me to, right. to call you. Yep. So Love I, Peter. Yeah, he's a, he's a very best nice first, Best First Amendment attorney in the country by far. Yeah, by I, far. I had approached him recently, and you might think I'm going a little too far here, Tom. I'd like your opinion on this. Uh, because I respect it as a, as a practical guy. Um, my feeling is that I might not feel totally vindicated until I see some of these guys in jail cell. Is that am I am I overreaching here? Should I just be content uh, with writing the book and, and and getting it out of my system and exposing the system, or do I have to punitively punish people who did this to me? I don't know. How do you feel about that, John? What's your take on that? You know, after I'm struggling with that now. I, I struggled that when my dad was murdered. I know you did. And um, there were there were times when I actually had opportunities to get that guy. I had people who approached me who said, "We can we can get something done, and it'll never come back to you." And that's something that you think about a lot because it's it's so it's it's so serious. It's a very serious thing. Um, I, I think over the years, what I've learned, and everybody's different, but what I've learned is that when you go down that road, you end up hurting yourself more. And um, although I well, would... Everything would be done legally. I'm not right, going to go right. after No, 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 I, I know. I'm not going to have a hitman. But, but I just think like the, the, the idea of retribution, um, for me, I've never been a revenge guy. I wasn't before my dad was murdered. Yeah. And, and even though I thought about some of the people who approached me after my dad was, was murdered, I, I, uh, and I did think about it because I don't think anybody in the world wouldn't think about it at that point in their lives. Yeah. Um, but I think I came to the conclusion, and over the last 30 years since then, I think I've just come to the conclusion that, that retribution and vengeance only hurts you. Yeah. And although I would like to see some people pay for what they did, I think, I think, some, I think someday Teach when I... Teach them a lesson. When I write the book someday, I think they will. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? So that would be enough for you, just I think to write so. the book. I think so, because I think, I think when you publicly humiliate people that have done bad things... I think, there's, I think sometimes that's the worst thing you can do to them, especially if they have a reputation. Look what they did to your reputation and how much it hurt you. Just imagine if this Dr. DiNapoli, right? Somehow, and others, and others. And, and others uh, go for a job at some point or they go, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to get on a TV show or something and then somebody finds out, you know, finds your book online and they Google them and they find out about what they did and they go, yeah, you know what, we're not, we're not going to deal with that guy. To me, that's always been... Punishment the enough. Punishment to, for me. And now I know there's other people who feel much strongly the other yeah. way. But I, I've always, and, and it's tough. It, it's a tough emotional thing because you're grieving, right? You're grieving because you've lost your reputation, your assets, you, your, your, your family looks at you differently. Everybody, when my father was murdered, I wasn't even the guy who did it. But like I couldn't go to the corner store and buy milk because the lady behind the counter who hadn't seen me since it had happened would see me. She knew my dad and she'd break down crying. And I'm trying to get over it. And then I go to the bank, and the same thing happens. Lady behind the counter, oh, I knew your dad, and she starts. So I actually had to move. I moved to uh, Florida and Alabama for two years just to get out of the area. Wow. Just so that I could deal with what was going on because I couldn't do it staying locally. Um, it, it, it's a tough thing. So when, when you start thinking about how do you make these people pay for what they did, um, it, 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 there's a lot of things you can do. You, you, you can get revenge. You can get retribution. I just think at the end of the day, that ends up hurting you. I think it just creates bad karma yeah. for you. I appreciate you know? that advice, Tom, because um, I've been struggling with it of late. Right. And, um, and although I'd love it's to... It's on the back of my mind. I'd love to see some of these people in your book 
go to jail for what they did or pay for what they did. There might be another way to do it, though. There might be another way to make them pay. There might be, whether it's a, whether it's a lawsuit or some other way, uh, you know, maybe another book about each... Well, p- do you about, think about, that I should have the DA explore possible abs- criminal abs- violations? Absolutely. Abs- send if the, my book to the DA with, it, the, with, the, with the intent of exploring criminal violations? Paul Tucker's a good guy, and if he reads this book, I guarantee you he would most likely do something okay, about Joe, it. Okay, Joe, I'll leave it at and, that. And, and, uh, and he's brand new, too, so he doesn't he's have... He's a DA. He's a brand new DA. Do you know him? I do. He's the, he was been on the show a couple of times. He was the former police chief in Salem, Mass., and, uh, and he's a cop. Straight so he's shooter. A straight shooting guy. If, so, if yes, I the, may chime in, sure. I think it also comes down to the type of person that you are. So are you the type of person that is more... Li- are you wanting to help people or hurt people? Right. So I think you seem like the type of person that gets um, enjoyment out of helping people. So if your book helps others, is that enough? Is, is that better than the satisfaction of finding out that they paid for what they did, like being prosecuted? Or is the satisfaction going to be far higher to know how many people this book is going to help? Yeah. And I think that, that resonates pretty You've strongly. You've given me with something me. to think about. Right. You've given me yeah. something to think Which about. Which outweighs the other. Right. And yeah. I know for me, I, I'd rather see 100 people help than two. I, of course, they deserve to pay for what they did. Absolutely. But if that is far less reachable than helping hundreds, thousands, who knows, hundreds of thousands right. of people that, are, that have gone through a similar thing to yourself, to me, I know that would outweigh it. That would make, that would warm my heart more than. The satisfaction of another that. thing, Tom, that I'd like to mention that you might not agree with, um, but I, I, I feel strongly so about far it. we're on the same page. Okay, <laughs> um, I from my experiences, I don't believe psychiatry is a legitimate profession. I mean, when an attorney, prominent attorney, said to me, You can go to five different psychiatrists and get five different diagnoses, and he was right. Does that tell you that the diagnoses are faulty, that they're fake? Does that tell you that bipolar disorder doesn't exist? And it's only being used to get railroad people into hospitals and make money for psychiatrists. Let's look at these diagnoses. How do you determine that someone's bipolar? Do you do a blood test? Do you do a brain scan? Or you just meet with them in your office for five minutes and say, I could see it in your eyes. You've got bipolar. And that's what's happening. Yeah. Psychiatrists are railroading people into hospitals because of bipolar disorder. Right. This is their big thing. You walk in, oh, hi, you've got bipolar disorder. Nice right. to meet you. I mean, this is crazy. Right. And we're, what is bipolar disorder? Let's get to the root of it. Let's examine it medically. Right. How do you come up with this diagnosis? Right. That's important to me, Tom. No, I, to- I By the way, I totally agree with you. I think psychiatry is voodoo. I think people- a lot of people are afraid to say that. Right. Well, I, I have no problem saying that psychiatry is voodoo. It's no. It, it is an industry, and it's no. It's no different than the medical industry right now, which is mutilating children because. Some teacher convinced a boy that he wants to be a girl or a girl that he wants to be a boy. And behind their parents' backs, these doctors are making a fucking killing yeah. on doing surgeries on children and mutilating children to make money. And Boston Children, by the way, if you want to do a little bit of research, is, is, is doing this right now. And they're making a lot. And they've actually admitted, uh, they actually had a, a conference where one of the doctors from uh, Boston Children's uh, ad- ad- admitted and talked about how much money we can make by steering kids toward these kind of surgeries. Yeah. And so I don't see psychiatry. It's psychiatry-, all profit driven. It's right. all profit I don't see psychiatry as any different except in the medical field you need doctors when people get sick. I don't think anyone needs a psychiatrist. I know people who have gone to psychiatrists and were more screwed up when they finished than, before the, than when they would, started. Would you agree that anyone who goes to see a psychiatrist should have his head examined? Yes. Or is that yeah. I, no, no pun intended? No, no. I, I, listen, I, and I know some good psychiatrists. They're very, they're very ethical and they're very, mm-hmm. uh, but they're few and far between. Right. A lot of these guys are just shouting. And the and question shouting. is, are, do, are they really needed? I mean, before psychiatry came along, we didn't have half the problems we have in this country right now. And when people had a problem, when I was growing up, when people had a problem, they didn't go to a psychiatrist. They went to talk to their priest. Right. They talked to their parents. They talked to an uncle that they trusted. They talked to the local police officer. Today, everybody's running to a doctor to get drugs. Then they get over-medicated. And then once they're over-medicated, the the psychiatrist can say, well, you're not competent. You're over medicated, and by the way, getting big kickbacks from Pfizer and all these other yeah, groups, yeah. right? And then they say, "Well, geez, now you you're not really competent." And then they turn around and they and they commit them against. Would you the, say that psychiatrists today are glorified pill pushers? Yes, I, in fact, I think doctors today are glorified. Are glorified it extends pill pushers. into the whole medical community. Absolutely, they are. Absolutely, they are. I got hooked. That's, that's interesting. I got hooked on Vicodin. I've never talked about this. How much time we have? Oh, a minute. All right, well, I'll make this real quick. I got hooked on Viking. I had one of my wisdom teeth pulled out, and the dentist, who was not like my regular dentist, was, wasn't around. I went to someone else. They gave me an endless script 
of Vicodin. And that endless grip of Vicodin, I went through like in a month, I was addicted. And within three months, I went from taking two or three pills a day to taking five pills, 10 pills a day, to the point where it didn't work. And it was either find something else to get rid of the pain, or what I did was I locked myself in my apartment for four days, threw up, I hugged my toilet for five days, I laid on the floor for almost five straight days, a nightmare. threw up and got myself clean, cold turkey. Now, most people can't do that. Most people, they're they physically not strong enough to do that. Um, but these doctors don't think twice about the effects of the money they're making on us. One, one thing I finally want to mention, John, and yes. you've got to wrap it up. Yeah, we do. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Kenneth Emmons, who's a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, not a medical doctor, pra still practicing out of Newburyport, he was not, you know what his background was when he, when he treated me? He was an ex-Lawrence police officer who had gone to school nights after his day shift and, and two years earlier had gotten his doctor of psychology degree. Wow. And I didn't even know this until my fourth visit with him. When I terminated my visit with him because of it, he hospitalized me. He section 12 me. And he didn't even use his so own. You, so you fired your doctor, who was supposed to work for you, and then when you fired him, he got mad and, and yes, had you committed. Kenneth, Kenneth Emmons. You see, he locked me up. Wow. And he wow. didn't even use his own name on the commitment papers because he wasn't qualified. <laughs> he used his associate, a medical doctor's name, on the commitment papers. I've never seen the associate. I've, I don't know wow. what he looks like. Wow. It's so a, this, this is criminal, and this is why I wanted to pursue a criminal law. If you could pursue that with the DJ's office, I'd appreciate it. I, I don't know if the statute of limitation has run out, but I, I will certainly get me an extra book. I will get it to him. I'll, I'll have a conversation with him. And if he can, he can. If he can't, I'll let you know. All right, Tom. But, but you don't know unless you try, right? All right, Tom. It's a, it's a great read. I have to tell you, I don't read many books. I don't have a lot of time to read many books. So I'm about halfway through this. And it is an excellent read. It's extremely well written. I have to say, I don't say that about many writers, but this is really well written for someone who doesn't do this for a living. It's and called, someone who's mentally ill. <laughs> it's called Snap Diagnosis. It's based on a true story. It's one man's long uphill battle against a powerful, sinister, and entrenched psychiatric establishment. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. And if he gives me uh, a couple of extra books, if you want to buy one from the uh, Valley Patriot office, you want to come by, I'll, I'll, I'll drop to, some off. I'll be happy to, draw, uh, to pass the money along to you. I'm not taking any cut out of it. I want you to make a lot of money on this book. I think that's the best vindication for you, to make a shitload of money on this book and to ram it up these people's ass. That's what I think. I know Thanks. it's a little, a little too crass for my regular audience, but it's just kind of the way that it is. All right, well, way over time, and I apologize, Chrissy. I know you've got to go. I'm going to... Why don't you uh, roll up Mel and we'll uh, give our sponsors McLennan Real Estate Century 21. Real estate is a. Uh, uh, if you look at the Valley Patriot this month, not a lot of houses have been sold in the Merrimack Valley. Normally we have three pages, we had one page this month. So we're going to see if we can get Matt McLennan on right after the bash. Marsan and Sun Construction. Ronnie Marsan, I need you to call me. We got a free uh, table for you with the bash this year. EIS, investigation and gun training. I love Joe Solomon. Thank you for buying a table to the bash. Uh, Tomo and Shaken Seafood, who donated gift cards for our raffle for the bash. Thank you for that. Clear Path for Veterans New England. AFC Urgent Care, Lisa Williams and Zakar and everybody over there. We love them. Pleasant Valley Landscaping, Dave Id Consoli, who gave us a $250 donation last year, last week for our scholarships. <sighs> A free shout out to JG's Ice Cream and Snap Diagnosis. Go on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can even um, you can even read it on Kindle. I'm sure, right? They can download it on Kindle. You can read it on your computer if you're a youngster. And thank you, Chrissy, my fine, fine producer. Melvin Taylor says you got to go home, so go home already. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.